We apologize for this brief interruption in the show. As many of you likely know, the Higher Standard Podcast is officially sponsored by Transcend Company. Transcend has been my longtime provider for both testosterone and peptide therapies, but they offer so much more. Whether you're interested in health, wellness, or longevity, it all begins with you getting your blood work done. A lab draw will help you get the numbers and establish your baseline. You can go to transcendcompany.com slash THSP. That's transcendcompany.com slash THSP. Or you can click the link in the show notes on any streaming platform and on YouTube. Fill out your information, and one of the representatives will contact you to get your journey started today. Now back to the show. All right, well, I'm, I'm proud of you, by the way, for um, for what you're for, proud of me for not going hard at the over oversized. No, I like that sweatsuit. I, I'm not gonna lie, I like that jumpsuit. I like, I like the color too. Yeah, it's like the worn in black color, kind of like a. Like been washed through, has like little white 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 spots in it. No, I noticed this when you wore it to the office, <laughs> Mister. I only wear suits to the office. That that was me a long time ago, a hundred percent. That was several months ago, dude. Okay, but now I'm living in a set situation. Okay, where I'm trying to appeal to Gen Z. Is that what you're doing? And I'm trying to be less intimidating. Yeah, I could come out like you know Gordon Gecko. Okay, like it's the Wolf of Wall Street. Okay, but instead I choose. To present myself in a more relatable fashion, and that involves oversized aloe sweatsuits and a nice pair of matching. Is that crocs. how you pronounce it? Aloe? Is that people call it ALO? AL I know. So I, what's the what's the proper vernacular? There's no periods in yeah. between. Why would you? That's like me calling you S A I E D. <laughs> yeah, that don't make any sense. That's true. Let's get right into it. So Chris and I get this question a lot. They want to know. Look, we're I'm new to investing. I don't know where to begin. Can you guys please help us out? And what we really want to do right now is try to make investing simple. Let's just simplify it for everybody once and for all so they have a source that they can constantly come back to. So I will start off right off the top. This is not investment advice, okay? We are not telling you to absolutely do this. What we are telling you is that this is a strategy that has worked in the past, particularly for me. Now, I'm going to discuss it with you, and I'm going to give you the specific stocks, or in this case, ETFs that I invested in, and subsequently the stock decisions that I made afterward. That being said, everybody's got a unique risk tolerance. Everybody's got a unique strategy. You can deploy this strategy in your retirement, your 401k, or your IRA as well. This is one of many. Right, exactly. And I think we should start off real high level, and then we'll get into you know some of the things that you've done in the past. Yeah. So... Right off the top, do not overcomplicate this. You can start off really basic. There are investment tools out there and structures in place for you so that you are not, you know, subjecting yourself to too much risk, okay? Um, an overwhelming majority of active fund managers do not outperform, you know, major indexes, right, or indices, if you will. Indices, yeah. Indices, yeah. See? If you're being proper. I mean, but you know, Winston's we're, 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 we're proper. We're that's not, not that's proper. Not us. <laughs> that's not who we that's are. Not, I didn't hit the clock, by the way. So just so you know, we started at 858. Okay. There you yeah, go. Yeah, okay. No we're close. I got you. Yeah. There you go. So, I mean, I feel like that's a point that should be, you know, well taken that just because you might be investing into a fund that's not actively managed, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be worried about it because they actually, in the long term, outperform active fund managers. What Said is referencing is there was a famous bet, a wager by the late, uh, great Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett, mm -hmm. in which the two of them said that effectively these passive income, passive income or passively managed funds, passive income, I'm still using real estate vernacular, these passively managed funds can outperform because they're low cost basis, can outperform an actively managed fund. Mm -hmm. Right or an actively managed account, and the idea was that if you put your money in these low cost index funds, over time they would outperform somebody who's actively trying to beat the market. Now I will say that is in and of itself a bit of hyperbole in a little ways. There are tons of value for investment advisors, wealth advisors. Right. For most of America, you have to have more money than they have, however, in order to get somebody actively managing your funds. And the closest most Americans will get to is they'll talk to somebody for their 401k or their IRA, either inside their company or at Fidelity or whoever's a custodian is for their accounts, and they'll get some general advice. 
Right. But there is a time and place where having an actively managed account with a wealth advisor is totally appropriate and the right thing for people. Yes. This is more a primer of how to get started to build your portfolio to one day maybe hand over to wealth advisor. Or if you want to continue to manage it and actively be involved in it over time, then so be it. But this is just the beginning baby steps. Right. In that wager by Charlie Munger, over the course of 10 years, they said, I keep saying Charlie Munger because I feel so bad that he passed away, but Warren Buffett really made the wager. In this wager by Warren Buffett, the premise was that they would outperform. In the early years, it was neck and neck. The actively managed funds and the passive funds, they were very close. But certainly over the course of a 10-year wager, and it was a million-dollar bet, and the profit, the, the, the winner donated that to charity, uh, the, the passive, passive performance won. And the reason why is lower costs, mm -hmm. so more money, compound interest over time, more money kind of matriculating through and, and building more and more value as this Low cost index fund really benefits trailing the market. The market in that case won. People will say, "Hey, the market's primed. It's going to go down. It's you know bad." You're really talking about dollar cost averaging. And for most of our lives, most of the people listening, it's not going to be a ten year wager. You're doing this for twenty, for thirty, for forty years. Yes, exactly right. And the key issue that Warren Buffett had with that is back at that time, the a common general fee structure that was going on with some of these hedge funds what they called was a 220 fee structure, meaning you would pay the hedge fund a 2% management fee. And then in addition to that, they would re also get 20% of the profits. Yeah. Right. So if you factored the, you know, those fees in and you factored in the costs and the, all the expenses involved with these funds that these other ind indices would outperform because some of them you'll come to find out have uh, an expense ratio of 0.05%. That's 0.05 of 1% right, of an expense ratio for the entire fund or the money that you have invested. Meaning if you have $10,000 in for to every $10,000 you have invested, you're paying $10 a year. Yeah. So th that's the difference that we're talking. And about. it could add up. So l without further ado, let's get right into this investment strategy that I started with. I will explain, I will give you the, the stock tickers, and then I will go into what I did initially and then how I performed. Okay. So I, I was not the person who came up with this, just full disclosure. I heard this somewhere, and it's been so long, I don't remember. It's, it's probably been 15, 20 years. Mm -hmm. But they're all low-cost index funds. They're all Vanguard funds. Now, there are very similar funds that everybody has. You can go to Fidelity. You can go to anywhere else. Uh, Schwab has some. These are not unique to Vanguard. You don't have to go with the Vanguard ones, but these are the Vanguard funds that I invested in and my allocations. So I started off with IVOO. I put 10% of my investment every single month into IVOO, which is the S&P Mid-Cap 400 Index Fund. Okay. Okay, so Mid-Cap are, are not your top 10, 500, you know, top 500 companies in, in the country. It's not your top upper echelon. It's your mid-level, mid-capitalization, mid-size okay. companies, right? Mm -hmm. So this gives you a decent exposure, but it's a small amount of your portfolio and that you're only going to put 10% of your money here. I took... 25% of my money and put in something known as VCSH. It's a short-term corporate bond index fund. And the key part to this is, so the first one was the, uh, Chris mentioned mid cap, and now we're talking about bonds. This is one way to diversify your portfolio. When they, when they, when you talk to a financial advisor and they, and they ask you about your risk tolerance, mm -hmm. and if you want to go either very aggressive, let's say you're younger or a little bit moderate, or you want to be conservative, one way that they use to balance out, you know, the risk tolerance is how much of your money gets allocated towards bonds and how much of your money gets allocated towards stocks because bonds are viewed as more of a safer investment. Correct. And frankly, when one side of the market outperforms, usually the other side of the market doesn't. So this kind of mutes a little bit of the blunt impact that you have a good healthy amount in the bond market. I put 15% in VEA. It's a tax managed fund for developing markets. So newly developing markets, the higher risk, only 15% there, but more upside for potential. Right. Okay. I put 10% into VIOO, which is an S&P small cap 600 index fund. So again, you got your mid cap with about 10%. Now you've got your small caps, your smaller capitalization, your smaller companies. Mm -hmm. You got 10% in there, but then next VOO, 30% in your 500 index fund, your your index 500 fund. And that that right there is the main investment. If you're going to make one of these investments and you said, Chris, I don't want to diversify. I can only make one of these. This is the one you go all in on. It's the VOO, the index 500, S&P index 500, 
low cost index fund. Right. And remember, this is tracking the 500, you know, biggest corporations, biggest companies, right? And if a company falls out and then a new company comes in, you're still actively following those 500 companies. Exactly. So that's 30%. Then the last one, 10% VWO is emerging markets stock index fund. Just another kind of higher aggressive potential for growth in the future there. This was my baseline starting point. So would you consider this a more moderate uh, risk tolerance, a more conservative or uh, aggressive? Oh, this is this is very conservative. Very conservative, yeah, right? Yeah, I, I, I wanted to be conservative on purpose. So the way I thought about this was my investment strategy when I started was I wanted to be conservative and have a long-time vision in place. This allowed me a true and tested methodology, which I felt was diversified enough. So a great example is, okay, you're, index, you're in the S&P index 500, right? Top 500 performing companies in the country. Can't miss. Can't miss. You're in the mid caps, right? Middle tier, and you're in the small caps. So you really encapsulate in the entire market. So if one of these is outperforming or one of them is performing badly, it doesn't drag you entirely down, especially because you're only 10%, 10%, 30%. Mm-hmm. But this gave you enough conservative benefits to also have exposure to emerging markets, new things, exposure to developing markets, and exposure to the bond market for tax purposes and offsetting the risk of the stock market a little bit. Right. But this was only a core. So what I did was is these were the investments that I was making every single month, and I set up automatic investments into these at those percentages. So if I put in $1,000, those are percentages that went in every single month. Now, when I first started, I put in 500 bucks a month. And I recognize that's a lot more than most people can do. I mean, yes, maybe right now if you if you haven't allocated, you know, enough money for it, you haven't planned for it, mm-hmm. but this is definitely that's definitely a reasonable goal that you should be able to reach to because if you do get that pay bump or that or that raise or you do get that bonus, we've talked about it on the show before, upgrade your investments before you upgrade your lifestyle. Mm. Right? That's got to that, be a t-shirt, like bro. That's like catchphrase. That's like a right? t-shirt, I mean. right? I feel like it's not sassy enough to be us, but certainly very factual. <laughs> yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, it needs like a little if, you, if you put comma bitch at the end, I think that would be us. <laughs> That's good. I like yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> Motherfucker. <laughs> yeah. You know, MFR, whatever. <laughs> Dual do meaning. Right. So this was my baseline. And what I did after this is probably not going to be surprising to most is I thought, okay, long term. What am I going to, what companies do I constantly ingratiate myself to? One of the first ones was Apple. I'm like, dude, I'm, I'm fully ingratiated into their ecosystem. Blue chip. I'm clearly a believer in Apple. And I thought to myself, I have a Mac, I have an iPhone, like I'm in there. Eco- I have an Apple watch. I have AirPods. AirPods, so underrated. The underrated, but hear me out. The AirPod Pros. Oh, I don't like those. I, I I bought them, returned them. I got myself the old school ones. The old school ones are better. Way better. They just pop them in. You don't have to worry about it. Now, on an airplane, the pros pros have value. The noise cancellation. The noise cancellation is huge. Yeah, big time. But, I mean, I feel like on an airplane, I'm not opposed to getting, like, the big boys out. I got the big boys for that. Yeah. They do smell like a gym because I wear them to the gym. Okay. But I give them no fucks. If I smell, like, fucking sweat and amazingness, those are I much want better. you to know. Those are much better because it just tells everybody, don't talk to me. And I smell bad. Yeah. Because yeah. people are hip to the fact that if you got the AirPods in, like they know that it might be off. You can just pull those out, bro. I know those work. <laughs> it's easy. Just take yeah. it out. Yeah, I can't. I, I got a man bun, bro. I can't get the, this big thing <laughs> off. Right. I want the one with the little like mic that comes in front of your face. Like I want the full headgear <laughs> with, with the Apple Vision Pros I've seen, on. I've seen people on the office. I, all I want you those. to see is my chin. Yeah, that's it. I want you to see part of my chin while I'm Imagine on a plane. Imagine having a microphone like yeah. this in front of you. <laughs> it's, I just, I don't, I don't want to be talked to while I'm on a plane. Right. Um. So that being said. I started investing in things like Apple, but I don't invest in anything that I plan on selling. I know a lot of people are saying, hey, Chris, you're going to miss out on the AMC and you're going to miss out on this retail trading. Yeah, good. I don't care. I'm good. Miss me with that. Yeah, I'm not. That's not what this is for. Right. So I put money in because I've got a day job. I've got real estate. I've got a family. I've got other things that I want to think about. Any investment that I make, I am making for the long term. I have yet to sell any of those long term stocks that I bought. Mm -hmm. Right. And the reason why is... This is not for today. This is not for tomorrow. This is not for 10 years from now. This is not to buy a house. Yes, exactly. So something that I think worth mentioning, we talked about, there's a, a right time and a right place for you know a wealth advisory firm to, for you to go to. But for a lot of new investors, you know, you're know you not going to meet the minimum threshold to maybe walk into that office or even take a meeting with some of these people because they have minimum requirements at a lot of these places. Yeah, some of the larger ones, 250000 right. half a million dollars, minimum, minimum relationship. Yeah. Right. But what Chris and I thought, okay... 
you know, to give the listeners uh, some benefit here is if you were to walk in to one of those offices, here's some some three key components that they're going to go over with you. And this is good for you to start thinking about before you start investing. And if you go and open up any brokerage account, you're likely to see a questionnaire that reflects some of these. Um, so you should begin to give it some thought, right? So the first thing that you should try to uh, tackle is what is your risk tolerance? Are you younger and you're willing to take a little bit more high risk? Bitcoin, uh, baby, to the moon. To the, I mean, it's down, baby. <laughs> we're going. We're back in the 60s. Is it, is it really back in the 60s? Yeah, I think it's like 63. It's it's funny how much you hate the the crypto bros that you know that. I don't. So I don't. I don't hate. When it was them. up, you had no idea. I don't look. I don't. When hate it was them. down, you know, to the penny. Look, 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 look. I, look. I don't hate them. It's like it's like the Clippers. I just hate that they're winning. I don't hate. I don't hate them. The Clippers are my team, man. The, what? Yeah. Okay, moving on. Uh, moderate risk tolerance or low risk tolerance. So are you conservative or what, right? So you're going to want to figure that out. Um, and then actually something that I want to talk about, a little backtrack real quick, when you talked about this breakdown you had, um, how do you handle the rebalancing it? Are you going back? So if like one one of these outperforms the other one, are you taking some of the, the gains that you made on that no. and reallocating it? Nope. You're just leaving it in. I'm leaving it in. This is the money going in. Okay. Not my ultimate end allocation in aggregate percentages, right? So you're not really rebalancing this at all? No, I'm not rebalancing this. Got it. Okay. Now, if I get to a point where I feel like something's super underperforming in like 10 years afterward, maybe, maybe think about it. But generally speaking, I don't rebalance. Right. This is my input allocations. Mm -hmm. More is always going to go into VOO. Right. Right. More is always going to go into VCSH, the short-term uh, corporate bond index fund. Mm -hmm. And then between the two of those, that's 55%. Yeah. Right? So- I'm not really worried about reallocating. Those are my inputs. Got it. Okay. Now, what I do that what I do really focus on is if I'm buying Apple one month, right? Because I like what the, what's going on, mm -hmm. or I'm buying um, what's, what's another one that I bought recent that I really believed in. I bought Lemonade, the insurance company. Oh, okay. I bought. Um, I can, you know what? Let's just let's just um, where is my phone? Let's take, let's, take uh, a gander. Let's take a little peek. Yeah. I mean, we're going to see two commas, you know, <laughs> but <laughs> two comma club yeah, over here. <laughs> that, that's not true at all. It's going to be like a, be a decimal in one comma. <laughs> but while uh, while Chris is looking that up, the next question that you're likely going to get asked from a financial advisor is, you know, what are your goals? What are you what are you trying to do with this money? Are you looking to invest and eventually buy a home someday? Is this really more geared for a retirement? Is it for children's education or is it you know maybe for the, your children's marriage someday you know how the kids be getting married these days all right so th this is going to come as no surprise to anybody <laughs> this is going to be kind of wild i own apple shocker yeah i own amazon as you should i own disney i mean if i'm gonna be going yeah. you know like if <laughs> yeah I, yeah you can't be having club 33 memberships you, and not you, be going you know how this went right first of all i don't have that so, uh, but <laughs> hey but you're waiting you're no, on the wait list no, you're on no, the wait list no, yes you are sixty thousand dollars up front plus twenty two thousand dollars a year you got that though my, my question to them is is like what who's having business meetings here who yeah where's the benefit dude so here's the benefit okay you want the real benefit here's the benefit it's the parking isn't it the, you go through the the California whatever hotel, mm -hmm. which is attached to um, uh, California. Like, what the hell is it called? California Adventure. California Adventure, right? It's literally attached to that. So you you park in that valet, mm -hmm. right? They have a separate little club thirty three icon where you can go through into this whole valet thing right through there. You go straight into the park, and you're into the park, and mm -hmm. then you could literally walk across the courtyard into Disneyland where Club thirty three is actually at. But you don't have to. Do, there's no parking issues for you. It's you know Gucci, whatever you go roll through. That's good. that's, that's beautiful. I right, don't get me wrong. But the, that the, is a little bit of a flex. It's a nice flex. It's a flex, but to who? Yeah. Let me ask you a question. Why don't you bring the family and go with me to Disneyland? We do that what once? Yeah. Right. Exactly. It's true. Once? Yeah. We do like a guided guided tour. It's amazing. And I'm like, hey man, next week let's go, bro. You'd be like, come on, dog. I just went. Like, I'm why? Not, why are you doing this? Thing. To me? Not, yeah. Right. And then they're like, hey, but you can have business meetings in Club Thirty Three, and I'm like. Hmm. Who's doing that? Who's doing right? Exactly. Like, well, you can get privacy. Nobody knows me, dude. I'm just tall. That's it. <laughs> you gotta stand out. I'm just tall. Right. People look at me and be like, he should be athletic, but I don't think so. <laughs> I see the cankles. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway, so I was walking in the park. I'm like, God damn, they're making a lot of money. And I thought to myself, okay, look, I'm gonna I'm gonna invest. If I'm going here, like the same with Apple, if I'm gonna use the products, I'm going here this much, I use Amazon all the time. Mm-hmm. So I this is this is literally how I think about investments. I know it sounds rudimentary and stupid, but when you look around you, the things that you are using that frequently 
and you were putting your money into? Because that's you believe in that company. You believe in it being around long term. I don't think that's stupid at all. I mean, I feel like that's the exact message that we're trying to portray here is that do not overcomplicate this. It's very simple, right? It really is. But people make it scary. Right. Those stupid ass social media like posts that you see where like if you invested all the money you put in all your iPhones over the entire time you had an iPhone, you'd be worth a million and a half dollars, bro. Right. That's dumb. Right. I but, made it sound dumb because it's stupid. It is stupid. But you should be investing in companies whose products you believe in. That exactly. And let's just let's also be very candid here. Prior if had you invested in anything, except for like last year, but over the last 14 years. Right? You would have made money. No matter what you would have invested yeah, in. Yeah. Stocks were growing, baby. It was all gravy. It was all Gucci. So don't overcomplicate this. Remember, just getting started is is half the battle. And then you can fine-tune it later as you go. Right? Yeah. It's just like no different than getting in the gym. Well, you're gonna you're gonna wait till you get the perfect workout. No, you gotta get in Bruh, there. You're the wrong person to be using this analogy. You get technical foul. What are you talking about? I'm throwing out a red card. Well, I'm working you out. About, you about ready to get kicked out this game. Why? <laughs> What do you mean? I got the home gym though. I'm not, I don't have to. How go to many the gym. times have you worked out this week? A lot. I just I don't log the workouts. You're not seeing the workouts that's, anymore. That's bullshit. <laughs> you're that's not seeing bullshit. the workouts anymore. You're working out, but you're just not logging the workout. Not logging the workouts. The fuck out of here. Does it's anybody subtle. believe that? Is anybody you told that story to gone like, oh, okay, it's subtle, yeah, cool, no, yeah, I'm just gonna come in on you one day, flex. Okay, here's what we're gonna do to prove. Oh, what are we gonna do? You're gonna come to my house. You're gonna work out at my home gym. Okay. And you're gonna cold plunge. And I'm gonna cold. I want. Okay, I'll do that with you. That's gonna be the outro to one of the shows. Stop, but you stop working out at your home gym. You know what I wanted to ask you? I wanted mm. to get those lap pull downs from you. You're not using those. Give those up, dude. Oh, the really cool ones, the grips that are nice. <laughs> I need those. I got every size of those too. Okay, can, can I get one just to test it out? I'm gonna put. I'm gonna put it. Keep them on my backpack now. When I go to the gym, I like you're to pull not, them out. <laughs> bro, you're not walking around with 40 pounds on your back. Bro, I, got, I, didn't, I didn't realize how the shit. I had like kettlebells in there. <laughs> I'm like, oh shit, I got these. Yeah, I, try. I have like loadable dumbbells in addition to the regular dumbbells. Right. Uh, why? Right. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> but you got it all in case in case you need it one day. You the want pandemic, the I went fucking ham. I'm like, oh yeah. I'm like you though. I like I like having that stuff around just because I like the option if I want to do I've it. I've got multiple barbells. Right. You I do? Got, I got the wide curl bar that fit the rackable one too. I got the normal one. Damn. I don't know why. Oh, the, the rackable curl bar? Yeah, I, dude, I only got it because Daniel at work was like, oh, bro, have you got that one? I'm, I'm like, not going to no. that, that is pretty nice. Rackable it's curl bar? It's completely unnecessary. Yeah, it is. And then the last question, just to wrap this up, is if you were to walk into a financial advisor's office, what they'll probably ask you is, what is your time horizon? Right? How long do you envision doing this for? And it should be long term. <laughs> I okay? just see somebody in the 20s going like, I think I, I feel like I should own 10 rental properties by the time I'm 30. <laughs> Based on social media. Yeah, I mean, that's what they're telling me. Yeah, it's how do we do that? Yeah, you could tell me how to do that, right? Look, I don't need to own all 10, okay? I just need to at least own five and be able to flex on social media. I need to be able to say that I do, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, because if you do the math, I'm basically a billionaire. <laughs> I'm just, I'm almost there. I'm one yeah. double up away. I, I understand you don't get it, but I'm going to help you understand. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so, and if you really don't know where to begin with that as far as your time horizon, just begin with, you know, your retirement age, okay? When do you plan? When do when would you like to envision yourself retiring? Obviously, like, air on the side of caution. We're all going to have to work a little bit later in, <laughs> into our years because, uh, except for you. Don't do that. I already see you flexing. No. <laughs> you like, not all of us. But um, <laughs> oh, I'm like, fuck him. I'm not working. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you, you should start with that date and then work work your way backwards. Think about other milestones that you, you know you have. If you want to take a certain vacation. You have a, a you know children, their college education, their weddings that you may have to fork over money for that I'm really stressed out about. Yeah, I don't <laughs> pay for that. I got a son. What do you mean? It depends on the culture, bro. Bro, he gonna marry whatever culture they pay. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I feel like I'm gonna get double screwed. Like I'm gonna have to pay both. Bam, bam. Yeah, you're gonna have an Indian wedding for sure. <laughs> you're paying for like a week worth of shit. <laughs> that shit a week, dog. Yeah. What are we doing? Not we, you. Damn. Are y'all Asians? I mean, Afghanistan is Asia. So is India. That's true. That's just factual. I Don't look like that. I am Asian. All right. I know what you're thinking. Wow. Oh, my God. I feel like I'm in the middle of Chris Crone's mind palace. But no. <laughs> no, you were not. You were listening to the number one financial literacy podcast in the world. This is the higher standard. Mm, beautiful, dude. Energy. I feel it. I'm gassed up. Oh, you're not gaslighting, though. <laughs>
No, I never gaslight. Well, that's you not do true. a little. I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. that's a lie. Some arguments at home, you be mm. gaslighting. Oh, all day long. Oh, yeah, all day long. Yeah, you're right. You did. Yeah, you're right. You're right. I'm wrong. <laughs> Fuck yeah, you're right. No, nah, because I'm stupid. <laughs> <laughs> we all do that. I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> sitting next to me, my partner in time, the one and only Said Omar. Everybody, oh, thank you, my man. Sitting next to me on my left is my partner in crime, Chris Nahibi. Welcome back to the show, everybody. And not behind the ones and twos is the man that I can call DJ Grover because he's not here. DJ Arun, everybody. Let's uh, moment of silence. Yeah, uh, in, in a moment of seriousness, we're not going to share why he's not here. We're just going to say he had a meeting with Weight Watchers and could not. <laughs> <laughs> do they still do that? No, that still thing? That's, a, that's still a thing, dude. dude. They should have done the one by my house. I was so disappointed to see him go because it was hilarious. It was like. Fast food restaurant, fast food restaurant, fast food restaurant, nail salon, Weight Watchers. Well, I know that they recently purchased for like over a hundred million dollars, like one of those like Ozempic companies. Do they really? Yeah, yeah. That's such a conflict, dude. Bro, come on, you. That's like. Listen, we know you can't eat right, so we're just gonna give you this shot because you won't want to eat. Honestly, okay, we're putting you on a different plan because you haven't been able to follow your other plan. Just take this shot once a week, and you're good. Can you imagine the counseling session? Hey, uh, Jennifer, bitch, you fat still. So we need you to take this <laughs> Why shot. Why gotta be a girl? <laughs> Why gotta be a girl? So this is a true story. This is terrible. And I, I'm going to regret saying this later on. Uh, my mom, by the way, has lost like 150 pounds. And she's had some stomach surgery. And she's gone to all these places. Right. Culturally, for my mom, it never worked for her. Never worked for her. And it wasn't because she didn't have the willpower. It, frankly, there was just a lot there biologically. I don't think we understand obesity the way we think we do. Right. And I think there's something to be said for Ozempic, for biology. There's 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 something that's beyond just like lusting for food there that we don't fully understand. Mm -hmm. We like to bastardize people and say, Oh, you've got no self control. You've got no you got you've got no discipline. Right. But the reality is there's more to it. Yeah. But true story, I went and talked to I was at, I was back east, there's is a program for Yale, and I'm in a room with a bunch of CEOs, and one of them is this this woman who came out, it wasn't Weight Watchers, it was the other one. I don't remember, there's like another one that's like that. Okay, I don't remember. And um, she was like the newly named CEO, and she was all about it, all this energy, and she was telling everybody her plan. And everybody was like, oh my God, that's amazing. Like You're getting such cultural adoption and buy-in. <laughs> and I'm sitting here going like, what part of this is making people not fat? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're like you're like ingratiating thickness into a culture, but you're, you're like, but they didn't want to demonize it. Right. And I was like, wait, so I raised my hand because I'm an idiot, right? And I'm like, excuse me, um, hey. Soft spoke. I, I just Changing have a question. <laughs> I don't fully understand. What do you mean you don't understand? I said, well, again, like I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings, but I know that we say things like everybody's beautiful, mm. <laughs> but are they though? <laughs> I mean, what is beauty, right? I mean, we have a standard. Yeah. That we're all trying to achieve, right? Right, yeah. Well, we don't have to lie to ourselves either. I mean, lose weight to be healthy, not because, like... It, so if we it? love everybody and everybody loves themselves, then why are they here? <laughs> you know, like, what are we trying to improve? It, it feels a little cult-like. I just don't know where, like, the line is. Yeah. She was so mad at me. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And essentially, I pulled her aside afterward and was like, I'm not saying that your model is going to fail, but I don't know how it's going to succeed. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, we don't even know the name of it, so I don't know if it, it oh, succeeded very I, well. It wasn't Jenny Craig. But, it was something like that. Anyway, But, wait. I mean, we've talked about it before on the show, and it's, uh, I think women have a really a hard time with this, is that because they, they don't diet properly, they do a lot of metabolic damage to themselves. So then when they try to correct it, the only real way to correct it initially is to reverse diet up. And who's going to reverse diet up? Oh, it's not just women. Men, men do this themselves, too. Like, everybody does this. And it's it's wild to me uh, to see how people, like, literally, they will do. They will go to such great lengths to buy. I had somebody today, somebody you know, call me up. This is a serious-ass conversation. And I love this person. This is not me hating. He calls me and he's like, hey, I'm going to go on this tea uh, cleanse. And Fucking first of all, don't say cleanse to me. Don't don't be that guy. Yeah, th throw that out. Yeah. Throw it out. You can't use that word. Like monkeys aren't like, oh, shit, I need to have tea for a week. <laughs> right? <laughs> Just so you could fudge your numbers? And, on, I, and, on those, and I know, like I know this was like an earnest conversation. He was trying to be like, you're a healthy person. Like, you're interested in this stuff. Yeah. And I want to be like, this is not healthy. Right. This is, this is cult-like. Yeah. And they're like, 
oh, I'm going to take this tea, and then it's, I'm going to poop out all these parasites. Because we have parasites in our body, and that's that's the that's where cancer comes from. And I'm automatically I'm like, oh god, like what social media yeah, personality gave I mean, you this shit? That stuff makes me really sad. Because look, if you're willing to go to that length, right? I mean, then you could actually do this the right way. Like, learn the right way and just do it the right way. And I got to be honest with you. So I, I painted a, a graphic picture. I said, let me let me just. As a friend, I'm going to paint a picture. Let's say your hypothetical is right, and we all have these nasty parasites, and drinking this tea is going to get rid of them all. And he goes, yeah. yeah? And I go, are you prepared to look down while going number two and see worms? Yeah. I mean, you're going to have to double check. He's like, would you rather have them inside of you? I said, yes. And never see them my entire life. <laughs> never see them. Yes. 100% yes. Jeez, man. If people need help. But listen, if you're listening to this on Apple or Spotify. That's a hard segue. Yeah, please make sure you go and leave us an honest five-star review. It does a lot for the show. We greatly, greatly appreciate them. And if it's good enough, we will read it on the show. And if you're watching this over on YouTube, please make sure you subscribe, ring that notification bell. Make sure you hit that like button. Let's get this video out to as many people as possible. Do all the moist, goody-good sassafras. Yeah, all that stuff that Saeed talks about from time to time makes no sense at all to you or to me. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. So this week was a landmark week for your favorite National Association of Realtors. This, according to the Wall Street Journal, what to know about the new rules for buying and selling homes. I will say right off the top, a lot of this has been sensationalized. Mm -hmm. And I've read a lot of articles about it. And if you're confused, that's okay. You should be. Yeah. They tried to make it very confusing. So basically... What this all comes down to is this landmark negotiation, besides a massive settlement they had to pay, comes down to one resounding theme. You can now negotiate the fees, and the seller doesn't have to pay your buyer's fees. So this is something that we need to get into, because I had some conversations over the weekend with some family members that were looking to possibly get into the market and buy their first home. Okay, And if you had your real estate license, like I told you to do for, I don't know, the greater part of a decade now you would be able to earn a commission from said transaction. You know, and uh, I told them, I told them that I, I should have had it by now to help them, but... Uh, but you're a degenerate piece of shit who doesn't I've kind of been busy show. with the podcast. That's that's my excuse. Don't, don't you, I did that. Don't you I did put that. that bad juju on the show, Ricky so, Bobby. So the way this used to work, okay, is... I, and I, I think a lot of people who have never uh, purchased a home for it, they don't know. So I think it's worth talking about, right? Mm -hmm. Is the seller is res was responsible for paying the their agent... Who's listing the home and selling the home? Yep. Their commission. That is okay, correct. Somewhere between one to three percent. Okay. Typically around two, two and a half percent on average, right? And then uh they were also responsible for paying the buyer's agent commission. Now, philosophically speaking, it's the easiest source to get the money because in theory, the person who's selling the home has equity in their home they've built up over the last year, two or three or four or 10. Mm -hmm. And because they have that source of equity, they have this free capital in their mind because it's not really tangible, tactile to them yet because they haven't monetized it by selling their property where they can pay these commissions. Right. But a lot of people who've been like, wait a minute, uh, fuck that. Why am I giving away 6% of my home value? Why mm -hmm. am I forced? Why is this... Why is this industry standard? Why should I be forced to give away somebody? Why should I be paying both agents? Well, yeah, there's there's that co there's that component to it too. And just uh, for reference point, the average commission paid by sell sellers has been roughly around five and a half percent of their sale price. Okay? Which, by the way, when home values were a lot cheaper, yes, wasn't so impactful. But now you got some of these real estate agents making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year on a side gig. On a side gig. Right. And then here's here's the messed up part. Some of these agents, right, are taking advantage of the fact that they have, you know, novice buyers that don't understand, right? Because you typically buy and sell maybe two, three homes in your lifetime on average. Right. They're selling them all the time, so clearly they're going to have more experience than you. That and I'm not saying all real estate agents are like this. We know oh, we got some listeners. Oh, you know shit talk to real estate agents? Boy. Well, I am very careful. I'm Please just saying. Please send all hate mail to Saeed at higherstandardpodcast.com. You, you can see a world where if a buyer is going to receive commission to, you know, get their, their borrower, their buyer to buy a home, perhaps they show them the listings that have a higher commission fee first and convince them. You might want to look at this property. This fits your needs more. You know it's wild to me? That is so wild. You know that's every, happened. Every real estate agent that I've spoken to has said they would never do that from an ethical fiduciary. I mean, they have, to, they have to admit. They, they can't admit to, to doing that. They, then they go to jail. 
yeah, yeah, okay, whatever. But here's what I'll say. It happens. It happens a lot. And it's steering. They're yes. steering you. And it happens internally to brokerages too. Mm -hmm. Hey, my buddy inside the same brokerage, the same uh, Berkshire Hathaway, same Coldwell Banker has a listing. Now the broker who has both agents working underneath them makes a commission on both. They can, you know, work out some way like to incentivize doing internal deals like that. They both get paid a little bit more. You get a property. Yes. Everybody wins in theory, right? Mm -hmm. Except for the fact that are you really being steered or are you not? Do you know? Do you exactly? So so keep in mind, like I said, the average commission being paid by the sellers had been five and a half percent. The projection moving forward, this is what they're projecting. I'm not saying it's gonna be true. A lot remains to be seen, okay? They say it's going to be... Where do, where do these projections come from? I know. How are you going to... Where, where is this going to come from? But now they're saying it's going to be somewhere between 1% to 1.5%. Okay. And here's what here's what every real estate agent I've talked to has said. Nope. Not going to happen. No. Mm -mm. No. You know, because they're, they're not going to budge down. Here, here's, the, here's the key difference, right? Now, a lot of these commissions are going to have to be negotiated up front, right? And so, you don't know. They may You may go into a structure where maybe these buyers are paying their agents a flat fee. So I have long said that Zillow and Redfin are going to displace MLS because every consumer, you, me, everybody and their mother can go on to this website, this mm -hmm. repository of information, and use it. We all know how to use it inherently because we all can Google things. Same yes. thing. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> wow, hairball. You know, when you have as much Contagious. hair as I do now. You would know you're rocking you low lows on everything. Wait, you don't have as much. What do you mean as much hair as you do now, bro? I got more hair on my face and my head than you have on your head, Christopher. You're skating on thin ice. Be careful. That's hurtful. Be bro. careful. That's hurtful. It, by by thin ice, I think you know what I mean. Stop okay. it. Okay, you. <laughs> you're just racist. <sighs> you, you were saying. I'm still matriculating. Oh, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to manage it. my emotions. Trying to bring it back. Got it. <clears throat> Sorry. Moment of silence. Just, it's just my a, hairline deserves it, bro. It's just a joke, bro. It looks really good. <laughs> no, fuck you. I don't need your pity. You don't have a ruin here to back me up or back you up. I know, anymore. man. Come on. Usually it breaks the silence yeah, by now. <laughs> You'd be like, oh. He's going to edit this and he's going to hear it. No, he's not going to edit it. Yeah, I'm going to edit this one. Also, he'll never see it. He doesn't listen to the show. show. Yeah, he doesn't listen to the show. Where was I going again? <laughs> we are talking about flat fee structure. Oh, yeah. So everybody can use uh, Zillow, Redfin, everything else, right? So if, in the, everybody inherently knows how to use that. And I don't know if you, anybody who's listening to the show or you have used MLS. It is wildly unnecessarily complicated. Mm -hmm. It looks really outdated. It is outdated. It is un and there's several different variants of this depending on which region you're in. But... The fact of the matter is, it is wildly outdated compared to Zillow and Redfin. Mm. It is way over necessarily complex. And if the consumers can do this, at some point in time, the National Association of Realtors is going to have to deal with, okay, they have a monopoly over the CRMLS. This is one of many lawsuits, which the one we just saw is going to wind up being much more problematic in addition to these fees. It'll also be the MLS access. Mm -hmm. I believe Zillow and Redfin will ultimately displace this entire system with flat fees. That's going to happen. Oh, really? Okay, I hope yeah. so. And that makes more sense when you think about it in the context of, again, I, I look, I have my sister's a real estate agent. I have a real estate brokerage. I'm in multiple states. Like, I'm not besmirching the industry or realtors. Right. But evolution is a part of business. I, I'll use a banking as a, as a corollary so nobody gets their feelings all, all sensey. You know, I don't want the, the fragile people to be fragiler. <laughs> right. <laughs> More fragile. <laughs> More fragile. Um, but um, banking as we know it today will eventually become extinct. I am not ignorant to that fact. Technology will displace a lot of what we do. And for the proponents of crypto and Web3 and the blockchain, that will certainly pave the way at some point in the future. There's a lot of political bullshit and lobbying between here and there. Mm -hmm. But that's where you wind up, like it or not. Traditional bankers are like, oh my God, blasphemy. Okay, whatever. It's just That's a matter, just reality. A matter of time. In real estate, no different. It's just a matter of time. Does it really make sense? Really? That if I have a home worth a million dollars, and let's just say I pay 2% and 2%. Mm -hmm. Okay, why Why am I giving you each 20 grand? Right. For what? What, what am I doing this for? I mean, honestly, at this day and age, yes, you have some subject matter expertise. 
Yes, I should pay for that. And you could be the world's greatest real estate agent. And guess what? I I am happy to give you 10 grand flat fee. Right. Buy, sell, buy house, 2 million, 1 million, whatever. It doesn't matter. Your services are the same. Right. Now, a realtor would say, my clients make a lot of money because I help protect them from bad decisions and risk and blah, 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 and so on and so forth. Yeah, providing okay. themselves more value. Contingent attorneys get paid on a contingency fee the same way. I like Law, that. another, another, right? If you get an award, right. we get 35%, but we carry all the costs going forward. Yes, I, I worked for a law firm that did that, right? They would take on cases. They only take on cases that they thought they could actually win. And they would see it all the way through. They would cover the whole cost. And if we were awarded any money, they would take 33%. So what if you're a real estate agent and you say the way you cross this bridge moving forward is say, hey, look, I think I can get you this value, right? If I get below that value, you pay me a flat fee. If I get above that value, I get my flat fee plus a percentage. Kind of like what we talked about the 220 fee structure earlier. Boom. Bring it right back home. Bang, gang, gang. That's what seasoned professionals do. This ain't no rookie amateur podcast. Yeah, what, did what did you think this was? I mean, I've seen some podcasts that have blown up that are two dudes sitting in the kitchen. We were talk well, we were talking about this. And I'm listen, if, if you wonder if if Said and I are, are petty enough to talk shit on everybody we see, absolutely we are. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not above that shit. I'm talking all the shits. Yeah, all of it. All of them. <laughs> on every single one of them. Okay. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not afraid. You yeah, know what? And exactly. I, I don't want to be the guy who talks all the shits, but it did. we so, didn't actually touch on the, on the Wall Street Journal article. I should probably so, get into the, take some quotes. Yeah, get into some quotes. But so w the thought process here is right now sellers are paying anywhere up up to 6% of the listing price, okay? So what what they're actually thinking is by by agreeing to pay this lump sum, right, you know, and having to renegotiate these, some of these commissions up front and the sellers no longer being responsible for the buyer's agent's commissions, that the listing prices will come down because sellers are, you know, inflating their listing price to account for those commissions. And first of all, there's another question that's also been posed recently. A journalist hit me up and was like, you want to comment on this? And I'm like, sure, what is it? Uh, will banks be willing to finance the buyer on the commission for their real estate agent? Absolutely fucking not. Yes. No. Which, which what does that what does that mean? So for first time home buyers, you're now screwed even more. Some of your down payment is now going to have to be paid up front to your agent, only eating into your down payment. Yeah, not so, so good. Not so good. Ma making the un unaffordability crisis even worse. I'm going to read the quote from the article, but you want my honest opinion on this? I'll give I'll give you the the conclusion. The spoiler alert. Nothing's really going to change anytime soon. Yeah, exactly. And why is that? Because there's not enough inventory on the market, right, mm -hmm. to really see the change. It's going to take some time for this to all kind of fizzle out and see what the new default setting is going to be like. Oh, look at you very colorfully described. Mm. Under the current rules, buyers typically don't pay their own agents out of pocket. As I mentioned, going forward under the new system, buyers might have to foot the bill if they want an agent to represent them. Starting in the summer, which is notoriously the busiest time in, in the industry, the new rules will require most home buyers to sign agreements detailing how much their agents will be paid for their services. If home sellers are unwilling to cover the cost of the buyer's agent, these agreements would likely require the buyer to pay the agent directly. Can you imagine that conversation? Hey there, Tom and Jane. Uh, <laughs> the seller's not covering my, uh, my commission, so I'm going to need you to uh, you know write the check. Yeah, so this is going to require buyers now to really uh, interview their agents. As a matter of fact, agents representing buyers will have wide latitude over how to charge their clients. Some might bill at hourly rates, while others might ask for a flat fee for the services. First of all, the first realtor to come to me and says, hey, Chris, I'm going to represent you, but it's going to be $100 an hour. You can get fucked, chief. Yeah, yeah go kick rocks, Paul. Yeah, that's not how... Ooh, Paul. Jeff, who do you want? Jeff. 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 Yeah. Avid commenter, by the way. Shout out to Jeff. We make fun of you because we love you. Yeah, you're part of the show. Yeah, you're, you're part of the team. You're basically a room. Do you want his job? <laughs> Immortalized. Yeah, you don't have to do much. You don't have to show up. We should get hashtag Jeff right here. Okay, well, <clears throat> we should get hashtag Jeff, but spelled the Jeff way. Yeah. Really obnoxious way. Exactly. Um, okay, so you're thinking, okay, Chris, if this is all much ado about nothing and, and this is all hypothetical and nothing has really significantly changed. Did the market react? How did yeah? Did the market react? Did the market go? Oh shit! The sky is falling, and like you know, wham, whammy. <laughs> yeah. um, well, according to Yahoo Finance, real estate stocks slide following the landmark realtor settlement. Settlement. Mm -hmm. 
Percentage change year over year. Pretty much they all fell off a cliff. Zillow, Compass, Anywhere, which is the house, and Redfin all took a massive drop down. Interesting. On the heels. And you think about it in the context, you think to yourself, okay, Zillow's in the space. Right. But they're going to be quick to adapt. Redfin in the space. They're going to be quick to adapt. Mm -hmm. Compass, okay. I've never been a Compass fan. They label themselves a tech real estate company, but they're just like a real estate company like everybody else. They look cool. The branding's cool. Are they really giving you tech? None of the tech shit they said they were going to do really materialized in my experience. So, yeah, they deserve to fall off. Okay. But everybody else, meh. Meh. Is Open Door public? Uh, Yeah. So, there's a whole tribe of people in the Open Door space okay. that have come at me. At yeah, you? so they, they got at you, as the kids say. Back when X was Twitter, okay, because I'm vintage, baby. Honestly, Elon, when there were blue birds and people were tweeting, there are a few things that I'm upset at Elon for, and this is one of them. That Don Lemon. <laughs> there's a lot of debate over the Don Lemon, you know, Elon Musk interview, like who was really right and who was wrong, and who was, and you know, is this the smartest man alive? And oh, Don Lemon got to burn, and you're like, <laughs> what? Like, I've seen so many clips, and I'm like, what is everybody? I'm confused. I'm very confused. This just looks like two men who don't like each other talking. That's exactly what it was. I mean, it's kind of like the podcast. <laughs> no. Come I mean, on. I don't like you, dude. You love The me. hair comment really upset me. You love well, you, you, I'm very you hurt. You comment my Lolo all the time. <clears throat> you can uh, grow that back. No, I, I'll be honest. The, I do the Lolo because the grays are getting out of control, man. I thought you did it because the Velcro. Like, I'm the long, you're the short, and we hook together. Yin and yang? I'm definitely the Yang Yin. <laughs> <laughs> All right. According to Yahoo Finance, shares of Zillow sink as much as 15% Friday alongside other real estate names after the National Association of Realtors reached a legal settlement that paves the way for home buyers and sellers to pay lower commissions. Lower is a questionable hypothetical scenario. I'm just going to throw that out there. Yeah, we don't know yet. To be D. Yeah. yeah. The NAR... I don't like when I say the NAR because I think it's like a surfer. Bro, the NAR was amazing. Yeah, the NAR, uh, the National NAR. Association of Realtors. Yeah, not G N A R. Yeah. Reached a nationwide settlement of claims that the industry conspired to boost agents' commissions. Conspired. I mean, that's a harsh word. That, that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty big. So, listen. It's dirty that, agents. I'll, I'll let you finish this because I have, I have a thought that why I feel like it's not going to change. Okay, good. The organization said on Friday, if approved by a federal court, the settlement will likely usher changes to the way consumers buy and sell homes. The NAR said it will pay $418 million over the next four years to end litigation. That's mm -hmm. a lot of money. Real estate names slid on the heels of NAR's groundbreaking settlement with investors expecting these rules to impact spending and competition for lead generation alongside Zillow's decline. So that makes sense why Zillow went down, okay? If you think people are going to spend, have less free money making opportunities to spend on leads, Zillow, which is mainly a lead provider and aggregator of data. That's, that's really what they do. That makes sense. Okay, so yeah. I guess maybe, maybe I was not stupid. Who knew? <laughs> alongside Zillow's decline, shares of Anywhere Real Estate, House, Compass, and Redfin fell as much as 15, 11, and 5% respectively. Because Redfin should not fall as much because Redfin's amazing. Right. It is, uh, in its 10K filed last month, Zillow noted, and this is a quote, if agent commissions are meaningfully impacted, it could reduce the marketing budgets of real estate partners or reduce the number of real estate partners participating in the industry, which could adversely affect our financial condition and results of operations. Yeah, let's just put things into perspective our a little bit. Our real estate partners. <laughs> and let's put things into perspective a little bit for people out there. There's approximately one and a half million realtors out there, okay, across the U.S. right now. 150,000 were added, uh, let's see, in the last, like, two years, in 2020 and 2021, actually, okay? Mm, okay. That's a 60% increase from the prior two years. Yeah. I feel like there's too many realtors, bro. Facts. No cap. Bars. All the bars. We did it reverse this time. We it's did. Very strange. Yeah, it is very strange. So, a little downsizing there would be better. But here's here's why I think that it it may not change. At the end of the day, people are sitting on some pretty big gains on their for the values of their homes. Oh, are you segueing? Huh? You like that? God damn it, Said. <laughs> You're the best co-host partner yet. Hey, guy. <laughs> yeah. See what I'm doing? But they're sitting. They're sitting on some some gains. 
I I can see a world that same corruption that we talked about earlier. How maybe a buyer's agent would steer their client over to uh, a, pro- a property that's maybe paying out more of a commission. Look, the seller themselves are gonna want to make sure their property sells. Yes. So they're gonna still come out and be like, "Fuck it, I'll give you two percent, just to sell my shit. Hurry up, come buy it right now." I can just imagine my uncle. Hey, bro. <laughs> I I will give you one percent. Yeah. Okay. No, 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 no commission for buyer. One percent. <laughs> it's what I give you. Right. Take it and go. <laughs> Take it and, and go. go. Right. Oh, for sure, he's gonna try to start on people. One hundred percent. And look, if you want the money, let's see, it's here for you. Right. If you do not, it's, it's okay. I'll find you know, someone else. Right. No pressure. Let me ask you a question. So, in, could somebody go through an attorney? In some states, yes. So, like, and that would be much less expensive. And, well, California, you can't. But here's yeah. a little anecdote: if you're an attorney, you don't have to take any courses. You can just sit for the broker's exam. Right. Uh, and I mean, like it or not, that's true. Uh, I actually became a broker before I became an attorney. So I sat through all the classes and everything else anyway. But mm-hmm. yeah, you can expedite some of those things in, in some states. And in some states, uh, attorneys handle the escrow. Right. So like they could literally handle all, all the documents for you. Yeah. No. Right. If you're if you're an attorney and you're in the real estate space, um, there, there's something to be said for whether you'd be conflicted if you looked at the contracts and everything else and then also did the buy, sell and the the uh, escrow. Mm-hmm. But yeah, you certainly could be an escrow, a real estate agent, all those things all in one and have a very interesting enterprise of, of multiple streams of income. Yeah. Yeah. It, it definitely could be fantastic. Uh, the segue that I was alluding to earlier that uh, just food for thought and to Saeed's point, according to Investopedia, U.S. home values are growing faster than the national debt. Let's clarify here, kids. Please do. The total value of all homes in the United States was $47.5 trillion at the end of December. Far greater than the $33.9 trillion of national debt, which Said has commented many, many, many times, will soon be $35 trillion mm-hmm. at the cadence we're going. If you keep track of the estimated value of your home on a listing website, you probably won't be surprised to hear that houses have gotten more valuable this year. But added together... The total increase was massive to the tune of 13 digits. Mm. 13 digits. That's a lot of digits. That's a lot of digits. You ever get those digits? Uh, no. You never got digits, didn't you? No. I've, I've only met one woman in my entire life. Her, her name is Joanna. She's my wife. Right. And since I married her, I've actually not seen another woman. You, you haven't even gotten her digits. My wife's? Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. No, no, no. no. She just has a tracker on me at all times. <laughs> The value of the U.S. homes uh, increased by $2 trillion in 2023. $2 trillion to a total of $47.5 trillion as of December, according to data from online real estate company Redfin. Of course, not Zillow's because you know what they suck. Mm. The housing stock is worth so much that, in theory, if it were all sold off, it would be more than enough to cover the massive and ever-growing number of the national debt, which averaged $33.9 trillion in December. That is insane, man. I was listening to... The team over there on Boiling Points, uh, remember them? Nope. The, the news outlet. <clears throat> they're, re- they're really good over there. Uh, Sagar mentioned that the uh, total amount of tax revenue made last year is now only enough to cover our interest on our debt payments. Yeah, we're paying I.O., baby. <laughs> that's that's there, We have a lot of other expenses, guys. Just, just <laughs> put it direct. It's only enough to pay the interest, nothing else. Yeah. So what, what does that mean? We're going to have to go into more debt. Yeah. That, that, we we need to, here's what we need to do. This is gonna be so unpopular. If I were president one day, <laughs> I'd be like, "Look, guys, here's what we're gonna do." Okay, I know you guys are worried about inflation. We got a debt problem, America. So here's what I'm gonna do. I know you don't want to pay more taxes. I understand, right? So here's my here's my promise to you. You will not pay a cent more taxes than you're paying right now. Okay, but I am gonna print thirty five trillion dollars in extra cash. And then I'm going to give that to everybody else. Okay. Japan, the UK, China. And I'm going to say, hey, congratulations, you're paid. Now, I know the dollar is going to fall in value. Mm-hmm. It's going to be basically pesos. We'll be like, you know, Mexico or the Philippines. But here's what I'm going to tell you. They both have spectacular beaches. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? You get to travel there for free. So maybe we'll get some, you know, destination travel out of it. 
Hopefully. We'll get a lot of Germans, a lot of people with strong currency over here, a lot of the Swiss francs. <laughs> the francs. <laughs> you know. Uh... <laughs> but your debt's gone. Yeah, it ain't going to happen, Chief. What? Never going to happen. Well, you, that would cause a high concentration in the stock market. So what? Roll the dice. That was another segue, bro. I know. I know. I I, I didn't want to segue to the new con. Like, you know what? Fuck it. I'll go there. <laughs> the Kobisi letter, stock concentration is now at Great Depression levels. Mm. You might not know what I'm talking about, but let's just break that down. Stock concentration, the concentration in value in the stock market, okay, is now at Great Depression levels. Not the mild depression. <laughs> the, just the greatest depression. Just the greatest one to ever live. Right. Little three and a half standard deviation event. Right. The worst recessionary economy in history. Why is that a big deal to be, for there to be a concentration? Well, you see, uh, if the entire market is propped up by a few, a small handful, a magnificent handful. Like seven of them? Yeah, in theory. All tied to a single sector like tech. Mm-hmm. Well, that's what some people may hypothetically call a bubble. Have we? Have, but have we ever seen a tech bubble? Yes. As a matter of fact, in 2001 site, I'm glad you asked. Oh, jeez. Oh, that shitstorm resulted in a recessionary economy. Mm. But that bubble was not as big as this bubble. It's, yeah, right. This is matching the Great Depression. And I hope for the sake of all of the world that this AI rhetoric mm -hmm. where everybody's oh shit they're using AI invest more money yeah gum, it's gonna blow up gumdrops and lollipops gummies and lollies yeah I hope for everybody that AI is as smart as everybody thinks it is and I'm a, I'm a believer honestly because if it's not we got real problems well AI is gonna have to solve this problem yeah AI the stock market's fucked up how do we fix it yeah stop putting money into it <laughs> Yeah, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't tell you this. Total divergence. There's a guy who went to Chamath and the All In guys. Okay. And he's an Iranian dude named Omid. And he built this AI-based platform where he's able to scan the audio and have it recreate AI conversations like mini podcasts based on all four of them sounding like them acting like them holy cow and engaging on topics and he could prompt it and it just did it so chamath no sax sax reposted it right so i ping him i'm like yo i gotta get in contact with this guy yeah puts me in contact with the guy right wow and i'm like yo can we do this for the higher standard he's like it's a security risk it'll look and sound like you and i'm like does any part of me make you think I care? Yeah, yeah. Please. <laughs> like Wait. the whole point of it, part of what we started this is we wanted to have something that outlasted us. Can you imagine if AI looked and sounded and acted like us? Right. Number one, it'd be rated R. <laughs> <laughs> number, have to be. Number two, can you imagine like how useless Arun will be afterwards? <laughs> I feel like you're going to replace not just Arun, you're going to replace me too. It's like, yeah, I'm going to talk to the digital version of you because digital version of you is way better, bro. Anytime I want. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hey, Chris, what do you think about this article? Type in the article. Boom. Yeah. Let me tell you why this guy's got a small winky. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's going to be amazing. So wait, yeah. so what do you say? Is he going to hook us up? He hasn't got back to me yet. He he said that we exchanged some DMs and 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 uh, he said he'd look at the amount of content we put out. Obviously, oh, by the way, I've been sliding into people's DMs for the listeners. Hopefully, we got some uh, some great content in the future. Yeah, that was a surprise. That, that was, was that was that was really. I didn't think that you were sliding in anybody's DMs. I'm trying to slide into DMs, I bro. I honestly didn't know that you knew how to use a DM. <laughs> honestly, I didn't either. I'd be like, can somebody please teach me? So your wife did this? No, she did. I did. Sure, it. she did. <laughs> According to Goldman Sachs, the stock market cap. Of the largest stock is now 750 times the market cap of a 75th percentile stock. Okay. Chris, what does this mean? What does that mean? One of the largest stocks, i.e. the Magnificent Seven. Okay. Okay. So pick one. Meta. Pick one. Okay. Meta. Uh, compared to the bottom 25% of stocks in the market, mm -hmm. right? That is worth, on average, approximately... 750 times that that's how much larger their capital that's how much larger the company is in measurement terms their market capitalization mm. 750 times larger okay that's a big size difference yeah it should not be that big basically yeah. it's it's you well, and me well well 
damn it. Yeah. It's always got to come back to you and me. I, it, there is a palpable size difference here. For those of you who say, hey, Chris, I'm watching you guys on YouTube. You look like you're way too close to the camera. No, I'm just that much larger than sight. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yeah. One day at a live event, you'll see. We got to do that. I want to do live reactions to the FOMC meetings. We got to get to that, especially now. With the setup that I have, I'm thinking about we just come in and we do that for our lunch one day. Ah, oh, fuck. Here comes Powell. His fucking <laughs> iPad's out. You know it's going to be a bad one. <laughs> He's got oh, a shit. Read. No iPad. I bet he's farting right now. Yeah, exactly. That's how you know. Yeah, it'll be, it'll be valuable. Right? right. I feel like it'll be valuable. 100%. Like, can you imagine like us being color commentators like dodgeballs at like cotton? <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. That'd be amazing. For the FOMC, and we just stream that live on YouTube. And as like the serious press Honestly, asks questions. we owe it to ourselves to do this. We've got to do this. If we don't do this now, we're going to regret it a year from now. we got to do it. You're Jason Bateman. You're cotton. I have to be. you got to be. i got to be. By the way, the uh, FOMC meeting tomorrow, right? I think so. Yeah. So we'll see. This one. This one's really important. So by the time this episode airs, it will already have come out. But the um, everyone's going to be looking at the summary of economic projections to see if where they see rates at, by the end of the year remains the same as what they did in December. Continuing on from the Kobisi letter, we have a chart which Arun hopefully will put somewhere in and around our bodies. Mm. Whether well, it's my body or your body. You got toes oh, out, bro. Shit. Sorry, I'll put them back in the Crocs. <laughs> it's just, that's the problem with Crocs. You can dip your toe out real quick. Bro, you brought the toes out. I find myself like full out like, hey, boys. <laughs> this is You're dropping them out. so confident. Me? Oh, yeah. I got great feet. My face ain't pretty, but my toes are. How often are you getting your toes done? Oh, not that often. Uh, but I do get a shiny buff when I get it done. And usually I get made fun of while I'm at the salon. Yeah? <clears throat> yeah. I'd be like, can I get a shiny buff? And they go, excuse me? I want it to be shiny. Your toes. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Shiny. Bust. <laughs> I want it. Bust. And they go, I feel like it's okay to be like, your nails painted now as a yeah. dude, but shiny buff still questionable. You know, I've never been. Actually, I, I, I take that back. I've been, I've been, I've been once or twice. I went once with you, actually. Just, just, to, get, just to get the Manny. We got the Manny's done. Did we do that? One time. One time. Yeah, by the house. I was like, you're like, you got to try it, bro. It's nice. I'm like, I don't know if I, I'll try it. I mean, I'm not opposed to it, but I don't remember. Was I trying to seduce you? Do they do... Do they still do like the shit talking? Is that a, still is that a thing? Or that was it? never really a thing. That's man. not a thing. They're not talking shit. Nah, man. Vietnamese like that. Cult, that culture's not like that. No, 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 wait. I don't even know. It's it's Vietnamese. Most of the girls in the Nelson in Southern California are Vietnamese. Yeah. Oh, okay, uh, dude. Vietnamese people for me have been some of the most important people in my life. Is there somebody in your life is Vietnamese? I don't so know. So I got I got the handyman. Oh yeah yeah. I got Sarah. Stud. Shout out to Sarah. Yeah, stud. Studs, both studs. She's a special kind of human. Man. And uh, Andy the barber. Oh, I try Andy's Vietnamese too. Yeah. 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 yeah all all amazing. Good. You know, I've, I've, I've uh, I gotta be honest, man. I've never had like a bad experience with Vietnamese culture. My right. wife, I'm Filipino. I've had some bad experiences with Filipino. Honestly, you're setting yourself up with this bad. So please tell me, what, what culture has, <laughs> have you had a bad experience with? Filipinos. <laughs> Filipinos, bro. I had a Yo. dude he caused eleven grand with the damage on my car. Why are you allowed to say this? Huh? Why are you allowed? to uh, say She this? knows the story. Really? Yeah. No. No. I, we had the conversation. Eleven thousand dollars worth of damage, bro. I had a car at his shop to get done. Like oh, a full, that, oh, I don't know. I don't know. And an eighteen wheeler backed up into it. Meanwhile, he he stripped the paint, left it out in the rain. It rusted. Wait, you never told me the story. Oh bro. my god, I sued him, and then uh, then he, the paint guy. Yeah, the kid. Yeah. Oh, okay. I sued him. He had everything under his his wife's name, but he didn't actually legally marry her, so I couldn't get anything. For, I've got like an eleven thousand dollar judgment plus like seven eight percent interest for like decades, and I keep renewing it to make sure it's up. And he keeps like ducking and dodging and weaving. I'm like, bro, like here's what I want you to do. Wait, you I didn't. That's crazy. So you you get a judgment against them, you add the percentage of interest. Oh, it's court default interest, man. Damn. So I didn't know that. I didn't know that existed. I think it's like ten percent or something. It's something wild. And I, I can keep it active by continuing to renew it every couple of years. Dude, I've had him come to a full debtor's exam. I sat across from him and asked him everything about his financials. That must have been so aggravating. Oh, it was the best. I, I made it last five hours. And I'm like, so you're telling me you're poor? Yeah. Yes. But you own a shop. Well, I don't own it. My girlfriend does. I work for her. Ah. But I called the shop last week and uh, you answered. Well, yeah, I run the shop for her. But you don't you don't get the money, no. So you couldn't why you couldn't sue the shop? It's a new LLC. Oh, and it's not under his name. Mm. That's the whole thing, bro. It cost me so much money and time. What bothered me is that he lied about it and tried to like hide it for a prolonged period of time with other people who had you know got screwed by him. Right, because you're actually I know I've, you've 
uh, you've been in not this situation, but other situations in the past where if somebody just like for you, I know you personally, it's communication. Just that's just, all it is. Just communicate with me. Meanwhile, ironically, here's here's the one of the best like humans ever, also a Filipino who's in the car in- industry. He's the one who saved the day, made some great referrals, like hooked me up, and like. If it wasn't for him being like a complete like angel to so- to solve the problems that happened there, if it wasn't for him going out of his way to do it, it probably would have never gotten done. I was gonna give up. And shout out to John, by the way. John, John came through. And it was fucking amazing. Shout out to John. Yeah. No. Uh. No. Again, Filipino. So, uh, you know, it's a wash. Complete polar. Yeah. It's a wash. All right. So to put the Goldman Sachs thing and the stock market concentration in perspective, even at the peak of the two thousand dot com bubble, the metric only hit five five hundred and fifty x. Right. So the Top companies were about 550 times the market cap of the bottom 25%. Okay. So now at 750 times, you're way above that okay. number. So I think that it would be negligent on our part to not now bring this full circle. We started the show talking about let's simplify investing. Mm. And now we're talking about high concentration. Yeah. Right? So if we had a listener hypothetically say, I'm confused. Just one of them? We have one? Yeah, yeah. Just, no, the OG5. Oh, okay. Just, yeah. There's only five of them. I'm pretty sure they just listen to the same YouTube videos like a hundred <laughs> times. Over and yeah. over and over. I uh, listen to K-Hate Radio now. K-Hate. Uh, um, I'll hate all day. So if if they come and they say, well, listen, I'm, I'm confused. You guys are saying just get started investing. Mm-hmm. But you're also saying there's a there's a tech bubble, right, that's really propping up the market. There is. Should, should I wait? No. And wait for it to come down to get started or just no. get started because just accept the fact that this is going to happen, you know, throughout the process anyways. No. Uh, and so here's the fallacy that really kind of rubs me the wrong way. And I love getting rubbed. And then this, I felt, God damn it, Chris. <laughs> just what? God, man. So <laughs> this, this is why I feel like it's important to bring this up because I know that some listeners would have walked away from this thinking like, wait a minute, like. I feel like this is like opposite of what we said at the beginning of the show. No, no, no. I, I think you. This is dollar cost averaging. That's what that the investment structure at the top of the show show is really doing. You're dollar cost averaging into a conservative investment over time. You're not mm-hmm. putting a million dollars into it like Warren Buffett did. Right. You're right out the gate starting with zero. So let's say you put five hundred dollars a month and five hundred dollars a month. You're gonna lose what a thousand dollars? Yeah, that might be a lot of money to you if you lost that money. But number one, you're not gonna lose it all. Your value might go down certainly. But your dollar cost averaging over time. Every single time you buy, you buy at $1 amount. Up, good, bad, ugly. Over time, it'll average out, and you'll be profitable. Don't think about the loss of money. Set up the good habits and discipline now. If you're starting right now, this might be the perfect time for you to start. Right. I know it's not like a... Because you'd be starting a, an account that's made for investing, but you got to really think of it long-term, no different than you would like a retirement account. Unless it's one of your goals is like to for it to help you like buy a car in the not so distant future, then that's a whole different story. But if it's a long term investment account, then you got to look at it as a retirement account where you're throwing money into it. You're not going to tap into that money anyways. It's going to be there for the long term. So just you might as well just a you know set a dollar amount in your mind that you're going to allocate and just do it and move on. So before I make a hard pivot into uh, rent rental rates, which I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about in the show before we wrap up, um, I want to put this in perspective. So we have hit officially a higher stock concentration than the peak of the Great Recession in 1932. And the top 10% of stocks in the United States now reflect 75% of the value of the entire market. The top 10%? The top 10% of stocks in the market. So the top 10% or 75% of the value. Right. So remember, we now talked about it also at the top of the show, why diversifying is such a, is so important, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's a more conservative approach. This high concentration is not good. It's not good. And just to be clear here, the top 10% is big tech. Oh, there's there's no question. So tech now represents 75% of the entire market. And part of me goes, okay, That's a concentration that's bad. But then I go, wait a minute. As we grow in society, humans invent things. That's what we do, right? We are about evolving things forward. And over time, we as humans, as a species, have done some amazing things. Just 100 years ago, the car was first invented. And now you've got Teslas and Rivians and these electronic cars, which you may or may not like. You got the internal combustion engine, 
We can fly transatlantic. We can go into space. You know, we, we have all these skills. We have made, we've split atoms and created an atomic bomb. Humans are living longer than ever before. I saw a 70 year old woman today who looked fucking jacked and looked like she was completely full, fully mobile when just a hundred years ago, people were dying at 55. Man, there was some lady that recently passed who was I think, 114, 115 years old. And up until like a year ago, she was still taking care of herself. Yeah, I love it. I love that. Taking my own shits. It ain't going to be me. <laughs> I mean, honestly, if I can't take my own shits, fucking. Metamucil, let me tell you right now. That's it. I'm it's, out. It's, Metamucil is honestly a secret joy. I know I sound old when I say that. Do yourself a favor, bro. I know you're not taking a sub, fiber I'm supplement. I'm not. Take a fiber supplement. Your poop the next morning will be a glorious experience. I used to take that other thing you recommended. Uh, something husk? What was it called? Oh, yeah, yeah. Psyllium husk. Yeah, psyllium husk. Yes, it's great stuff. It was okay. What? It's, it is, it's disgusting. It's thick. Okay. Take Metamucil. They have some flavors that are sugar-free. Tastes like orange tang. Who doesn't love tang? And you poop. Sweet joy. Come on, man. It's like this just smooth. It's good. And if you know you don't have any hair down there like I don't, it's even better. Oh. It's just a real clean transition. I'll be honest with you. I've been in the bathroom with you. Nothing ever sounds smooth with you. Okay. No, no, it's because there's no hair buffering sound. <laughs> I mean, it this is why women don't get enough credit. We're an hour in. We can, go, we, we can start women don't like get this. enough credit for, for being women can pass gas in like such a science based, articulate way that men don't appreciate. Got it. As a man. You get moist booty every once in a while, right? Big, big black, God rest his soul. He covered that. <laughs> you know? No, but I, I got the compression shorts. It never feels moist. No, it still you still get a little warm down there. But if you if you you know have that experience and you make no sound, but you have no hair to muffle the sound. Honestly, it's it, it's impressive. It, and women women can do some impressive things that me, we as men don't understand. Right. I feel like we we could if we cared enough to though. I care. I can't stop it. No, you don't. It's care. a freight train. You don't. No, no, you don't I care. You're, you're, no, you're, I do care. You're really disrespectful when it comes to this stuff. What do you mean? You just let your rip, dude. You don't give a fuck where you are. What the fuck am I supposed to do? You're, you're, you're supposed to care, bro, and walk out of the room. What do you mean? Oh, you mean like farting? Yeah, yeah. No, I do that to you because I don't like you. <laughs> Oh, like, I don't do that like in like to social settings like people like oh, oh sorry guys I got to fart. Oh you're at like, dinner, not, yeah, yeah. No, you're that guy. No. Okay. No, I'm I'm classy as shit when I'm out with people. Yeah. Just with you, you know. Yeah, no, you're that guy that lets a rip and be like, can you believe that fucking guy? I, ha <laughs> that, I have that's done that. You, that's you. Yeah. If you, if if odds are I'm telling you it smells weird in here, it's me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just the statistics aren't good for me right now. All right. So. <laughs> All right. Let's get back to the apartments. I think this is valuable. So I. <laughs> Jesus. Oh Christ. man, what a pivot. There's no way to get hey, back to. Apartments. Hey, you're not gonna get. You're not gonna get this anywhere else. You're not gonna get that in the first five minutes of the show. That's for damn sure. <laughs> right. Because everyone's gonna be like, I can't take financial advice from these farting assholes. <laughs> hey, we keep it real. We do. I'm like, I, like I. If one thing you know you'll get from me is honesty. Yeah. All right. So I linked up with Jay Parsons, who's a rental housing economist, and I found that to be interesting. A rental housing economist, and I've met a lot Specialty, of housing economists. Huh? Yeah. So, and I'm in the MFR world, multifamily, residential, which is apartments for a lot of people who don't know. So they also get classified as commercial. Real yeah, estate. commercial real estate. Yeah, exactly. And they're demonized a little bit right now by social media. Mm -hmm. I found this interesting because I know there's a lot of rhetoric about where rents are growing and going and growing <laughs> for that matter. Mm -hmm. And people are saying, okay, there's all this concern in the markets, but this was really fascinating. This actually kind of flipped the perspective on my head. Um, remember all those doomsday forecasts for apartment rents last summer that hasn't played out. Instead, we've seen high volatility, uh, give way to remarkable stability. At a flat 0% where rent growth has held uh, for the last seven months, we haven't seen this type of stability since the ancient days of pre-COVID. So all this thing that we were, oh my God, rental income is going to go up, they're going to come back down, and when they go back down because, you know, consumer discretionary spending is going to come down and people aren't going to have the money. Well, that, that hasn't happened yet. Right. As a matter of fact, it's a net zero. Right. So a couple things that have happened. Number well, that, one. That, that's great for investors. I mean, and maybe for renters, they were hoping for the opposite. They were hoping for rents yeah. to come down a little bit. Yeah. And I don't think you see downside pressure in rents until home prices get any cheaper. And there's no real, there's no real correction on the horizon yet. Right. You know? 
So, number one, doomsday forecasters miscast the rent growth slowdown as a broad-scale catering to a myriad of perceived challenges, from economic to affordability, etc. But it was really all about supply, so you got to look at where supply is going in historically big numbers versus where it isn't. Low supplied markets continue to push rents at normalized levels at around 2 to 4% increases. A very healthy normal rent increase for most areas. Yes. Ultra high supplied markets are at the are the ones cutting rents. So anybody who had more deliveries to the market mm-hmm. had rent, rental cuts or concessions to get people in the door to rent there. Like Sunbelt states. Exactly, the Sunbelt region. Number 2, Doomsday forecasters underestimated the strength of the apartment demand in 2023 and 2024. Even many people in the industry don't fully appreciate the strength of demand because they may not feel it or see it, meaning their vacancy rates haven't shrunk. And this is this is true in California. I went back and looked from 2018 to 2023. Vacancy rates in California never dropped below 97% with the exception of 2018. And I think the number that I saw was an anomaly and I think the data was wrong. But you mean So you mean 3% vacancy rate? 3% vacancy. They were fully occupied, 97% occupancy on average in the state. 2019, 20, 21, 22, and 23. And that's even during the pandemic. Right. And I, I can only speak on behalf of what I've personally underwritten. I've always underwritten to nothing below 4%, mainly 5% vacancy rates. So they're, they're just fine. Yeah. So meaning the vacancy rates haven't shrunk. But that's just because while there's a lot of demand, there's even more supply. So although that... Demand is getting spread out amongst a greater number of properties. Mm. Right? So it makes sense. Right. Impressively, even with supply soaring upward near 50-year highs nationally, apartment vacancy barely budged during the winter months, a seasonally slow leasing period. Vacancy held flat through the first two months of 2024 and is down just 10 basis points, which is 0.10%, by the way, right. since November. That's remarkable. Number three, in my last point here, doomsday forecasters miss the evolving affordability story. That housing affordability does have ramifications into rent. Mm. Rent Rent-to-income ratios have actually trended downward over the last year as incomes have grown faster than rents. That was surprising to me. Yeah. Wage inflation has moved faster than rent inflation. Yeah, which is something that the Fed is not happy about, right? Because if they're trying to tackle inflation, that also includes wage inflation. They don't want wages to go up more than 2%. So if that trend were to continue almost as certainly as it should through 2024, and if so, it would entirely erase erase the rent-to-income bump from 2021 to 2022 and bring rent-to-income ratios among new lease signers, at least anyway, back to pre-COVID levels. Okay. So it's a huge narrative shift. No one's talking about it. But wages rising faster than rents widens the demand funnel, and that's a win-win for both renters and for operators. Dude, I know the so that couple that I was talking about earlier that was looking to get into you know the market to buy yeah. a home, their um, their rent just went up four hundred fifty bucks in Irvine. Damn. Ugh. And the problem is we have a state rent control, but, but that state rent control is based on inflation. Well, it's based on inflation, but it's also for older properties, not new properties. Yeah, new properties are an exception. So if like these newer these newer builds, right? That's why I told people not to lend on new builds, man. Only downside risk. Yeah, honestly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, they're gonna get leased up, and then what? Yeah. People people aren't gonna make. But I mean, then again, Irvine is its own market, so it's like they literally just they do whatever the fuck they want out here, and they get away with the murder. It's a monopoly, man. Sooner or later, that conversation is gonna happen. It's a monopoly. Dude, so, and then my, my other cousin, who, who you know, like, he he pays over three grand for a one-bedroom. Bro, my brother pays, like, $3,700 a month. For a one-bedroom? Nah, it's like a one, a two-bedroom, two-bedroom, two-and-a-half bath. I think it's the same size as my, dude, my home, I pay $1,700 a month for. Yeah, but that, no one's, no one's getting that. You can't find that now. I got it. <laughs> when, bro? No, don't do that. 2012. Yeah, don't do that. I'm just... I get it. I understand the the shift. Yeah. But damn, bro. I know. 30, how much for a one bedroom? Like 31, 32. <laughs> At that point, I mean, he doesn't have enough money to buy a place. Oh, he does. Down. He does. I just don't think he knows where he wants to settle down. 
We gonna have this conversation? <laughs> no, we're not having this conversation. I like your cousin. I don't want to do this to him. I love him. But uh, he about to get blasted. No, why? I'm about to super soaker his ass. <laughs> so, damn, kids don't know what about the super soaker back yeah, then. Yeah, they do. Day. No, they got they got water yeah, guns. They, they got are they still called super soakers? You would know if you were coming to my son's birthday, but you're not. Oh man, yeah. You told me like what two weeks before the birthday party, bro? bro two weeks I, the before kids, the birthday party is plenty of time, bro. The kids got oh they got invited to a birthday party literally two months ago on that same date. So you tell the parent you forgot about it because they invited you too early. <laughs> yeah, Who yeah. does that? <laughs> I know. The only problem is like they're friends. They're like really good friends. Imagine how bad I feel for them if they have to go with a family one instead of a friend one. <laughs> yeah, I know exactly. Sending the wrong message to those kids, man. <laughs> there you go. Okay. How much is how much does the birthday cost you? Not that much. Uh, we downsized a little bit this year. I did go over the math with Joanna. I'm like, look, if we spend on average ten grand a year on a kid's birthday party, ten grand. I mean, you saw last year, bro. We had like fucking th- three bounce houses or some shit, and like, we, no, we had the ball pit. We had the the big ass massive adult size bounce house. We had another one, dude. When we when, had the catered, when, we had a fucking boba catered. When Carter gets older, I'm gonna fucking make sure boba, dude. When Carter gets older, I'm gonna make sure he's dropping rose petals everywhere you walk. Okay, you better appreciate this shit. Prince Hakeem <laughs> Yeah Prince Hakeem baby <laughs> No I, dude I, I, So I told her I said look if Are they did, coming out With another one by the way A third did, one Did they already no, come they already out did, yeah. They already did I never saw it Bro it, Don't I think that's why I didn't I don't. think I was too afraid I was going to disappoint There were so many things That I thought Should have been addressed That they didn't touch on That Was Arsenio me. Hall in it Yeah How was he He was good I mean it was No worse than You know yeah. Than Simi from the first episode Or his first season Simi was good he made it. You need that kind of character. You need that character. Yeah, of course. Like you need, like you know, like everyone hates Phoebe on Friends, but you need her. You gotta hate. So- you gotta hate one of them. I haven't seen enough Friends episodes to really know what that means. Oh, I listen, can't contextualize. Listen, if you never know, if you know what I'm talking about, leave us a comment. That's back in the days when I was grinding nonstop. Grinding nonstop. You couldn't watch Friends. It's thirty Just minutes, bro. Trying to become a billionaire, bro. It's on Nick at Night. Huh? Is it really? <laughs> yeah. It's on Nick at Night now, bro. That's those guys, on Nick at Night, bro. Those those six or well, five now. Oh, I know. R.I.P. He, my favorite one too, Chandler, bro. Damn, Matthew Perry. Um, they're making still on royalties like twenty mil a year. So sad. Twenty mil a year on that show still to the day. Well, you know we'll make royalties on this show someday. <laughs> someday, it's, we're gonna get there. Probably not gonna make twenty dollars on it. <laughs> Honestly, if you're stuck around this late in the show, make sure you head over to transcendcompany.com/dhsb. Hook yourself up with some longevity. You know, we, we've been moving units there. I know because I think people are really Listen seeing the value. It. And actually, when Arun comes back, he promised that we're going to get into a segment, and it's the real reason why he's not here. And we'll leave it up to Arun when he wants to get into it, whenever he feels comfortable. Um, it's Weight Watchers. <laughs> no, Did it, Craig? No, it's not that. But um, there, there's a lot of value there that you know you can take advantage of. You know what? I got? Oh, do you, shit. You know what's supposed to be delivered today was um, the face cream. They have like a copper base. Uh, Prescription based face cream that I got for for Joanna and I. I'll be honest. So it's been. Bro, I don't know what you're doing. You're not tapping into that resource, man. I need to because even I don't know. fucking Adam. I was talking to Mind Pump Adam, Sexy Adam, Sexy Adam, Sexy Adam, Mind Pump, Mind Pump. He's doing like a semi glutide uh, alternative from there. From I know, from there, I, I know yeah. that he's also doing all the Caldera Lab stuff that they got going on. Yeah, the stuff that Transcend sent me is like way. It's like pharmaceutical grade shit. Yeah, it, it's different. I'll be honest. So. um the last, I don't know why you're not on my I'm, I'm really, really bad. I've been really, really bad. But the last three weeks, I've been really good. My wife's got me on a whole skincare routine now. And I'm, I'm doing it nightly. I truly feel like the reason why you won't touch the peptides is because your wife won't let you do it. No, no, no. She's all for it. No, she's all for it. She's like, as long as you feel comfortable, you do the research, you're going to fully commit to it. Because we've talked about this. A lot of this is like you're committing lifelong. No. No, not the peptide the stuff. The hormone stuff. The hormone stuff, yeah. You don't I mean, need to do but, that, though. I don't need to because the testosterone's through the roof. We already know. You see the hair. You already know. I'm sorry. The hair is... Yeah, because it, it just keeps growing. I got laser hair removal, bro. It keeps coming back. It just can't help itself. It's got to come out. Wolverine. I'm just going to let you have this moment. Yeah, let me have I'm that gonna moment. Have let, 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 yeah, let me I'm have gonna it. Let you but no, like, you, if, you, if like, anything, you, that's the path I'd want to go down. You could take Matsi, right? It, it, it would... It improve your your cellular function. <laughs> Seriously, it improves your mitochondrial like ATP process. It's yeah. I'm not doing it justice, but boundless energy, like no jittery nonsense. And frankly, like it, it was it was honest. It, it's Sal's favorite peptide tooth. Like I was to tell you, um, BBC 157 like healed everything. There was like even the small like muscle aches from muscle pulls was gone. 
Um, Tesafenzine was fantastic for belly fat loss. Mm. Like it Targeted. really incredible. Targeted, like it really targets on your. Ironically, tesafenzine was originally established to go along with people who were taking uh, HIV medication. Okay. Because apparently, a side effect of some of the medications people take for HIV is that they get belly fat, targeted belly fat. Mm -hmm. And tesafenzine was what they gave them in conjunction with that to make sure that they didn't add that targeted belly fat. Wow. But it does have, and my, so my wife takes, my wife actually took more than I did. She's still taking it now. Joanna lost 15 pounds. Wow. Yeah. Did she, so, do, did she do a DEXA scan beforehand? No, we're going to get those done, though. We talked about it like a couple days ago. Yeah, yeah. I feel, I feel like, like that would be so good to do like a before and after to make sure you maintain all the muscle mass. I need to do it now because I've gained a lot of fucking muscle. Like yeah. it, it's, it's at the point now where it's like, okay, I, I can acknowledge I'm bigger. Right. Yeah. I mean, physically, too. Yeah. You know. You feel stronger? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I do. Yeah? Yeah. I, I move around some pretty heavy weights. Nice. I think I, I think I lift more weight than people expect. Why? Oh, I mean, because it's obviously it's harder because you're taller. I think people just don't realize how tall and how large I am. Like I think I think feel like a lot of people don't really understand how much harder it is to move weight like that when you're taller. Your limbs are longer. It well, it's also harder to develop like the muscle bodies that look as full as like a shorter person. You can you can literally develop those faster because it's just less lean muscle mass to put on. Like ten pounds on you is gonna look a whole hell of a lot bigger than ten pounds of muscle on me. Yeah, and ten pounds of fat also looks a lot bigger. Yeah, and I got a lot of that too. I say that. that's not true. I, I, I really don't. You really don't. I really don't. No. I say that. I keep I keep thinking the joke. Ah, I'm fat, bro. And it, no, I'm not fat at all. You're not. No, you're it, not. It's at a point where it's like you know I, I got body dysmorphia. Yeah, that's why. I feel like I'm you. <laughs> that's why you get, you got to channel your inner Sam Zelik. Selleck. Zellick? Is that his name? Sam Selleck. Selleck. Yeah. Selleck. Yeah. yeah. Guy's jacked. It's, I'm, I'm worried about him. He's getting too jacked. He, he, you, you can tell he struggles to breathe. He's like, <laughs> like Arun does it, but for different reasons. <laughs> <laughs> when you were prepping for the show, were you doing, uh, I always wanted to ask you this actually, because I was listening to an episode of Mind Pump where they were talking about um, the stomach vacuum. Were you? Were you oh, the posing? Yeah, were you, were you practicing that at all? So I had a posing coach, and he was fucking ruthless. Like, he was, like, a legit old-school veteran. Mm -hmm. And um, I would FaceTime him, and nothing makes you feel more gay than FaceTiming a dude with a pair of shorts on and then posing for him on camera. This is basically OnlyFans. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. But I'm paying him right. to watch me. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, like, low-grade <laughs> right? OnlyFans. And I remember posing in front of him. This is the guy who's done, like, some pretty big names hey, you in the felt space. Pretty, you felt pretty uncomfortable. Well, I knew that your first show, you're not going to, you're not going to, unless you're, like, large, like, a large human, and you lean out, and you get to, like, normal sizes or, like, buff sizes, yeah. most people are not going to look very good their first show, mm -hmm. right? You're going to be lean, certainly. Yes. You're going to feel like you look good for you, but you're not going to realize until later on when you look back how really skinny you were. How skinny you were, and you're probably a little disproportionate in some areas. Right? Uh, yeah, for sure. My, I, at, at my first show, at 6'5", I was 187 pounds. Yeah. 6'5", 180? 187. That's my sh that was my show day weight, 187. And I reconstituted back up with water almost... You know, instantly up to like one ninety something, but right, water and a burger. I mean, how 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 much earlier before the show are you before the stage time? Did you cut out water completely? Uh, I didn't actually cut out water completely. The day before, I stopped drinking as much. I tapered down, and the day of the show, all I had in the morning is I had a cup of coffee. Oh, so just oh, really? Just the day of the show? Yeah, there are people who are. So I was already. I was like. So I was sub 5% body fat. I was lean. That's scary, man. Like I, I was very, very vascular. So that I didn't, didn't really... scare you at all? Um, it was really interesting. So I, I noticed when I drove, like I could look at my forearms and just see all this vascularity in my forearms that I had never had. I'd yeah. seen other people. Other people naturally have a little more or less vascularity in certain parts. Like my wife has very vascular like forearms and like calves. Like mm -hmm. she's just got like, she's got, my wife could have been an amazing athlete. Like you can tell she has like that predisposition physiologically. Got it. Like, when she was taking tesafenzine, she just lost, like, her belly fat, and it's, like, full six-pack, like, outline. It's wild. Right. But she's tiny, right? Mm. For me, I had never seen that before, and I was like, oh, that's crazy. And I, I, didn't, and I didn't realize how skinny I was until I looked back. Now, keep in mind, I'm, like, 260 now, and I'm probably, if I'm being honest with myself, maybe somewhere in, like, the 10 to 11% body fat range, maybe. I mean, that, that's comfortable. You got to be comfortable with that. 
I'm not. I've got body dysmorphia around it. Yeah, but you gotta you gotta get comfortable with that. That's healthy. That's what you want to walk around. And then if you ever want to do a show in the future, then you could cut down. I will say that that's the point where I'm at now physically, where I could I could certainly lean down to like show ready in sixty days easy. Yeah, but show ready, man. That's so like, I don't know. It, it's not mentally unhealthy. I don't. No, 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 no. I, I don't think so. I think there's something to be said for, let's say, let's say this. Um, actually, right in April. Right? You say to yourself, okay, I want to get lean for summer. I know it sounds like a, you know, hey, spring break, yo, dope, cool, we're in college thing. But right. no, as an adult, I think there's something to be said for, it's almost like Ramadan for for you. Yeah. Right? It's like, this is a disciplinary thing. I'm going to do this. I think it's, I mean, Ramadan's what, 40 days? 30 days. 30 days? Mm -hmm. oh, God, I really got to go back to Muslim school. <laughs> uh, Islamic school, whatever. Um, is it really? Yeah, roughly, approximately. Anyway, okay, so uh, in Ramadan, like you fast all day, mm -hmm. no food, no water, and you can eat as much as you want at night. Right. So it, it's tantamount to the same level of discipline, dude. By the way, Kyrie hit a game winner the other night. I know left handed left flying like. You, hey, hold on, fasting. I know. If he would just shut his mouth and play the game, he would be an. Unbelievable... Which he did, which he has been this year, and it's like, oh, you're up for a new contract. It's funny how you're able to do that. That's, yeah. that's the part that's like, come on, man. Yeah, and some of the stuff that he said is wild. Like, yeah, no, you can't you can't justify any of it. Yeah, like just in in the sad part is he's not a dumb man. No, he's actually really bright, but I mean he's also I don't know he's he leans heavy into the like conspiracy theories and yeah, yeah but yeah when you're a public figure unless you're like Rogan you really can't get away with that. Yeah, and Rogan I, I want stuff to say is, he was like one of those like flat earthers too. He was, yeah, he was right. Yeah, I remember he said it. And then Steph also like mimicked it. He echoed it a little bit. I don't know if he went full full throttle. They both did it at the same time. And then Steph's like, and then Obama reached out to me. He was like, hey, you gotta cut that shit out. But he didn't. Obama didn't reach out to Kyrie. He only reached out to Steph. I, I don't. I, I've literally seen the sun rise over the ocean. What do you, you need to I mean? see? Like, Come like, on, guys. Well, it's just um, it's not science, right? The Earth's flat, so when it goes down from the plane, it disappears. <laughs> just gone so now it's in the other side of the rectangle right yeah yeah it's it, it, it's weird man right. bad. well and would you got anything else i got all the things by the way i got a win this past weekend adam's adam's team oh congrats yeah it was big it was big for the kids last year we didn't get a win till late in the season so this is the first one early was it was it me we got a real shot at a championship this season was it me or did you start coaching at one point and then stop no 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 no, no. if i committed to a season i committed that's actually what I, the first thing I did this season. So I've learned a lot over the last couple of seasons. I've I've coached like three seasons in a row. And this season what I did is first practice, I, as a team huddle, everybody bring it in. And I said, parents, you guys bring it in too. I, brought, I made the parents come in. And I said, the word for the season is commitment. We're going we're gonna to hone this message in, okay? What does commitment mean? It means doing what you said you're going to do when you no longer feel like doing it. Is that why you still come here? That's why I said I'm going to be here. I'm here. I'm going to see this bitch out. So you're going to pull a rune in the huddle when you get home? <laughs> yeah. Hey, I got to teach you about this word commitment. So then I said it to the parents, too. I'm like, we've all committed. And then the, and then what I do also at the end of every practice, I bring the kids in. I ask them what they learn. And then I always make sure to say, hey, when we break this huddle, I want each of you to go to your parents and say, thank you for bringing me to practice today. Because it wasn't easy for them to bring you here. How long are you going to do this for? <clears throat> Until I can get Adam on a team that I'm like comfortable with. That's the benefit, right, is... Doing this, so Adam, dude, he's he's knee deep in basketball. He can only talk about basketball now. It's 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 consumed him, and I'm like, okay, we got to scale this back. It's it's becoming too much, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and so I've I've got him like, you know, okay, we can't talk about basketball now. You got to read, like, you can read this book on this. Read this. so there's a, some kind of healthy balance because it's consumed him, right? But I'm gonna do this until um, the. Oh, here's the benefit. Now that I'm coaching, I get to see all the other coaches, and as we continue to grow, and they've all seen me, and they like, I introduce them to my kid after, and eventually I'll be able to be like, hey, can my kid jump on your team next season? And then just ride that out. I'll pick a coach that I like. I like his style, good team, good kids, and be like, there you go. Okay. Yeah. Nice. That, that's that's the plan. We're gonna probably take Carter out of swim. I mean, he learned how to swim, though, right? That's what my wife said, too. I'm like, but... That, that was the whole thing, right? You nah, just want him to learn how to swim. But he does the backstroke. He does the fly. I mean, he does all this shit. Yeah. And like, he's... He, I mean, he's, he's fully good capable. At it. Of the water. No, he's good at it. He likes it. But he's in jiu-jitsu. He's in swim. He's in come on. I mean... 
It's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah. So, I think but I mean, awesome. they're they're capable of it. You get them used to the schedule now, it'll be just clockwork. Uh, I hope my son doesn't fall in love with basketball. I don't know how I'm gonna react to that. Yeah, man, it's honestly it's challenging for me. I, I told I've actually told some of the parents like, oh, you're so lucky. You played basketball growing up, and now he's into it. I'm like, if if he I, if I could choose, I would say I hope he didn't because yeah. it was a. Uh, uh, in one way, I just hope that I can actually teach him like there's a balance, right? And, and love the game for what it is, but I also don't want to crush him and be like, "Look, this probably is not going to pan out for you." Damn. Right. I hope, he asked I hope me, your wife doesn't show off. He asked before. me. He asked me, "So how come you didn't make the NBA? You seem to know so. Like kind of like you seem to know so much. How come you didn't make the NBA?" Bro, at least he asked you, and you can you know you can go like, "Look, I'm short." Yeah, no, I was like, look, I didn't have any good mentors. I'm short can't stop. I did. I was like, no. I was like, I, I told him. I said, it's not all. It's not always about playing. There's, there's, thousands of other jobs. Bro, what am I gonna do when my son asks me that question? What do you mean? Yeah, you're six five, like two some. Yeah, you said you had a real shot, but then you, you chose this path, for longevity. That's true. I didn't, I didn't. I don't think I had a shot. Looking back on it, no. You you made it further along than yeah, than most, but I don't. I, at best, I would have been a role player for a team. At best, hey, and I mean that's an experience, though. I make well more than league minimum, at least then, anyway. Versus yeah. Now, yeah. Now league minimum is like eight hundred. Is it really? Yeah. I'm gonna go train to play in the NBA. <laughs> nice backup. God damn. Yeah. I could live off that. Uh, how many years? What do you mean? I, mean? I think the average career span is like three or four years. Is it really? I think. Hey man, these bankers are dropping like flies. Not everybody's there, LeBron out here. Twenty one yeah. years. Yeah, you know he's tired. He's got to be tired. You cannot love it this much. He doesn't. He's just trying to play with his sons. That's it. You think? I think he's just trying to set set these records so high, like no, none of you guys are coming close. Maybe. Good for him. I he's, would too. He seems like one of those legacy guys. If I was fifteen years in the league, I'd be like, look, I'm just gonna put up as many numbers as I can, like stupid shit. <laughs> I want my name to be in the record book for everything. Yeah. Like, who's the goat? I don't know. Let's see who got. Oh no, no. Okay. Yeah, you know, he's that guy too who knows like he's the first player to get a triple double on a Tuesday after seven p. Like you know these stats are getting crazy. You're like, come on, you guys are trying to make everything historic. Love like, it. You love that? I love it. You don't love it. You don't even watch sports. Nope. <laughs> I want it to be so convoluted that nobody cares anymore. Yeah, that's what they're doing. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Good night, everybody. Bye. Reverse. Reverse Uno. <laughs> <laughs>